How you doing guys? It's Alessandro here from Spicy Massage with some new tips in order to help you creating your own green area indoor or outdoor following the principle of do as nature does. Growing your own food is slowly becoming not only a pleasure but also a necessity. Over the past two years the COVID-19 pandemic has had different effects on different kind of business including the food suppliers. Recently, you might have heard of the term food shortage popping up. While we're still not sure how or even if this could potentially happen, it's always a good time to start learning being self-sufficient with the added bonus of being prepared for any eventual surprise that this could potentially bring. So dig up the like button and today I'll show you the best tips to get prepared for a food shortage. Before panicking and start buying loads of food that might turn bad because left unused, it's best to check your food reserves. Monitoring your family's consumption for one month might help to estimate how much food you need in order to keep your family to getting hungry for long periods of time. Remember to organize your stockpile in a neat and dry area. Ideally, your storage area should be cool because a cooler area helps to preserve the nutrients in your food and maintain its overall quality. Keep your food off the floor and store it in organized shelves, which will give you the opportunity to sort it out based on their shelf size. Water is the most important item in a food stockpile. If you think about it, the human body is made for about 70% of water, so it's only natural that if you would like to survive, you will need a lot of it. You can live for several months without food, but you will last for only a few days without water. Therefore, you must stock a good amount of water in reserve and you should also secure an alternative source in case of emergency. However, stockpiling a one-year worth water supply, it's pretty impractical. It's inefficient and it will take up most of your storage space. What you need is an emergency water purifier. This compact and handy devices have layer and filtering medium inside them. This will remove suspended materials, bacteria, and even traces of heavy metals. You can buy these water purifiers at your local shop, and I will also leave a few links in the description of the video for a few different models. Canned vegetables, fruit, beans, and other canned goods can last for about five years on your shelf. They are an excellent addition to your stockpile that will add a diversity of flavors. If stored properly, they can maintain their quality for even longer periods. Canned goods that are beyond their best by date are still edible and can be consumed. However, their taste and aroma could be a bit different and might put off a few people, but you can still use them regularly and consume it as normal food. Rice, it's another essential source of calorie which could turn out really useful during an emergency situation. It is easy to cook and prepare it, and it could be a really good complementary food for any dish. When stored properly, it can last for about five years, or even longer period of time, depending on the variety of rice that you're storing. Salt is another essential item that you should never forget to add to your stockpile. It could be used to add flavor to your otherwise bland food, and it's also great to preserve and store vegetables by mixing them with brine or using other techniques. Another great thing to add to a stockpile would be pasta because it could last for over 20 years if kept in the right condition. Beans are a protein-rich fibrous food that could add variety to your food reserve. They could be stored for up to 10 years if stored in the right conditions. And usually what I do, I dehydrate my fresh beans from the garden and then I store them in glass jars. Also, there are many other things that you can grow in your garden and dehydrate for later use in the year. For example, here I've got some dehydrated tomatoes or I do the same with chilies or you could potentially do the same with mushrooms picked up from the local park or woods. However, if you don't like to either freeze or dehydrate, you could potentially can your food and use it later in the year. This is great because Doing so, you kind of activate the fermentation process and other than having all the nutritional value of the vegetable that you preserve, you will have probiotics forming during the fermentation. Thanks to these bacteria that are forming during the fermentation process, when introduced into your system, they will help you with your guts and strengthen your immune system. I would recommend getting a few tools in order to help you preserve the food in optimal conditions 
and avoid spoiling it over time. A dehydrator is first on my list of essential tools for storing food. It is easy to use, energy efficient, and it could also be used for any kind of food. You should simply fill up all the layers of your food dehydrator, set the temperature and time to start it. It will preserve not only the flavor, but also the nutrient content of what you dry. Another great item on my list is a vacuum sealer. Vacuum sealers preserve food by preventing the growth of mold and bacteria. By vacuum sealing your food, you prevent oxygen to get in contact with your food so mold and bacteria thrives only when oxygen is present. Containers are my last item to recommend when you store your food and you should always use food grade containers. These containers are designed to prevent hazardous non-food chemicals to transfer from your container to your food. If you're using a container that is not designed for this purpose, there is a high risk of contaminating your food. Also, as mentioned before, they could be used for canning and preserving your food for a long time. If you follow my previous videos, you should know that I have a small urban garden here in central London and I try to produce most of my food. You don't need a massive space to produce food, but you just need to think out of the box and use the space that you have available in different ways. For example, vertical gardening might help to maximize the amount of food produced by your garden but also companion planted and intercropping might help to condense a lot of vegetables in a small area. Also, there are many different vegetables that germinate and mature in just a month time, like for example, radish or spinach, and they could be preserved in different ways to be used later in the year. However, not everyone owns an outdoor space, but there are still ways to produce food indoor by using artificial lights or just your windowsill. The next thing that I would definitely recommend to grow if you have a balcony or a garden would be fast growing vegetables. What I mean is vegetables that germinate really quick and take just a short time to fully mature and be ready to harvest. Depending on the variety that you're growing, they could be planted in shade, partial shade or full sun. So they are pretty versatile in the garden. Also the open window to plant them could be many different months throughout the year. Fast growing vegetables that I would recommend to grow are spinach, lettuce, radish, and also green beans and carrots. You could also use them to interplant in between main crops to maximize the potential harvest from your garden. There are many ways to preserve them by dehydrating, fermenting, or freezing, and using them later during the year. How you doing, man? How you doing, Steven? It's going really good. I uh, got lots of fun things going on in the garden. My uh, pigs are getting close to harvest. So I'm gonna be harvesting one of them next week, so I'm very excited about that. And uh, yeah, things gonna be better in the garden, that's for sure. Yeah, here everything needs to be slowed down because of the weather. But yeah, we're getting there. I'm harvesting a few things, yeah. I don't have any animal, unfortunately, because I'm in an urban garden, but yeah, I'm harvesting some veggies, so I'm happy. It's the way, it's the way everybody gets started, is just for some veggies, and then you just start adding on more and more fun things, so. Yeah, this is the way you started, right? You used to have like an urban garden in, in San Diego. Yeah, so my name um, is Steven Cornett, and I started out as an urban market gardener. I had three different urban plots in San Diego, California, um, and I grew all that out and sold vegetables at farmers markets um, and to private customers and you know, I did a YouTube channel all about that stuff and now I'm on a bigger piece of land uh, in Tennessee um, on the east side of the United States and a totally different climate you know humid 50 inches of rain a year um, there's actually a cold winter so it's been a big learning curve just um, adapting some of my growing techniques to what I have to do here now uh, but also getting to experiment and try a lot of new things like animals I before just had layer egg layer chicken. So now I've ventured out into some other things. Oh, that's amazing. I wish I could try that. I, I always wanted some chickens to have in the garden, but maybe as soon as I move to a bigger space, I can, I can do that because I, I really want to start to supply myself with all I need. Absolutely. And that's what, you know, we want to get into on this video is we've just noticed so many more people getting into gardening or interested in it because of different supply chain issues going around the world. There's talk about there's different food shortages or different, you know, like here in America, we've had huge issues with getting slaughter dates for our animals. So it's very difficult for, for farmers to get, get into the butcher to slaughter the animal so then it can be sold to the customer. Uh, so anyways, there's been a lot of different things. So we wanted to focus this episode on trying to give our best tips on how we can help you grow the most food as possible. Yeah, 100% because, yeah, most people are kind of, you know, underestimating what's going on. But in my opinion, when they start announcing something like this, 
on uh, major TV channels or you know major communication service it's something that you know it's happening like we are we are totally in it you know so it's happening all around us it's better to start now be ready you know and it doesn't take much you know yeah you, you can just start small and slowly as you say you know add up more and more things absolutely man you just got to get started somewhere and just even if it's just a couple peppers a tomato plant and a, a head of lettuce like that's just a wonderful start um, if you've never done this before as soon as you taste i don't know a fresh tomato from your garden that it's 100 percent organic it tastes completely different like it's it's literally like another another vegetable like it's not it has nothing to do to whatever you buy to the shop yeah exactly man you nailed it that's that was one of the big eye-openers for me is when I, I tried growing my first homegrown vegetable and I ate it and I was like, this is so good. This is better than anything in the store and I don't know what I'm doing. How is this possible? Um, and, then, and then you start, and then that led me down the road of, well, how does agriculture work? And then you go down the wormhole of, oh, wait a second. <laughs> They're poisoning us. And also, yeah, it's not only about like uh, stocking up food and like getting ready uh, like with a garden, but it's also like fertilizer for the garden or inputs to actually you know grow grow your own food that's uh, another step that introduced us to jadam right so you know i think all of us gardeners we know about making compost and what an incredible amendment that is for your garden which i highly recommend everybody you should always have a compost pile going but the jadam which i've been so happy to find you recently and and see the work that you're doing talking about jadam because it's just so fantastic um, for creating your own naturally made inputs. So whether that's a fertilizer, a natural pesticide, microbes, like it can all be done within this Jadam system. Um, I'll have to show a picture of the book, uh, but Yong Sang Cho's book uh, is fantastic. I, yeah, yeah, I just highly recommend everybody get that book. And you know, this is a way that you can like if you don't have to go out and spend money on anything because you could make it yourself. Yeah, since I started using like natural inputs from Korean natural farming, I was literally now every time I have a walk in the local park or the local woods, I look at things in a completely different way. Like the way I perceive nature, the way I see uh, even under the leaves, like the mycelium growing and I know the function of this mycelium and it's it's so all so connected and and it changed my view completely like it, it's blowing my mind every time i think about it <laughs> i know and you know everyone i see get into creative natural farming has that same experience it's it is it's just really incredible you start looking at everything around you as hey could i could i use that to feed my plants or to you know you know grow up more microbes and and the, the cool thing i think even like for people living in a city like i am uh, you can source all you need to start growing your own food without having to buy fertilizer or having to buy amendments for the soil. Yeah, I want to emphasize to people that you can really start with like nothing. Just one little four by four foot raised bed box in your backyard or your neighbor's yard. Or maybe even uh, there's a field across from your apartment that's an unused lot. I even think it's a good idea, you know, if, when your rains are happening in like the spring, I don't know if you get rain then, but you could just throw seeds out there or put transplants out there and let them go crazy. Like a, I think of putting out like a sweet potato. What I'm trying to do right now, it's so like in UK, lots of um, front yards are just left without like unused. So what I did, I transformed my front yard into a vegetable garden with raised beds. And every Sunday, I'm, I'm giving away some free vegetables to, to all my neighbors. And, and also, I stay there, I sit down for like two to three hours in the morning, and, and I'm available to answer any questions. So if anyone wants to start it, if anyone wants to do something similar, even smaller, you know, even if they plant, like if they have like a few pots in the front yard, it's already something, you know, it's already like a start. Yeah. That's so cool you're doing that, Alessandro. It's so nice of you to, to give your time out like that. And these are like the type of things though, like doing those little acts of service and trying to help your community. Like that's that's what pushes the needle forward and into changing things. Also, what what else would you recommend like for people like I don't know, getting getting ready for a potential like uh, food shortage or uh, you know or potentially whatever this pandemic could bring. So one thing that I'm 
lacking in knowledge on that I'm really trying to learn about right now is food storage. So like canning, pickling, fermenting, um, making more out of your harvest. Because a lot of times, like let's just say squash plant, all you gardeners out there know, it, just one plant will produce enough squash for your family. So if you've got a few of those things going, you know, what can I do with all that so that I can eat that later on in the future. And just going into the future, you should also have a store of food for any type of emergency. So the, those freeze-dried uh, products that are like, they last 25 years or more, I would have at least three months worth of food. Um, just in general, every, every individual or family should have that, I think. Canning and preserving is definitely something that, like, it's a bit lacking in this society lately. Especially like, in a climate zone like mine, that you can produce not the whole year, but you are kind of limited at some part in some parts of the year. So uh, this means that thanks to preserving, I can you know grow the food like during the summer and then preserve it for the winter and use it throughout the year. So so that's that's amazing. That's great. What what else could be recommended to people like to to maximize their harvest even if they have a small space? Well, definitely interplanting. I mean. It's probably the biggest, most useful technique I've ever experienced with gardening when it comes to your planting. And it's how I was able to make a lot more money on a small piece of property by doing this. So interplanting, like I, I just want you guys to think about, like you have the 2D space, right? So all along the X and Y axis, right? So, but you can also go vertical. So you wanna think about your plants, not just um, how wide they spread out, but also how tall they spread out. So things like, Tomatoes and cucumbers grow really tall, right? Especially if you're pruning them. Underneath them, there's a whole lot of sunlight energy that's hitting down below um, that's just being lost. It's either going and hitting your soil, drying out your soil, which is a good reason to use mulch, a straw mulch or wood chip mulch on top uh, to increase the moisture retention. Uh, but you can also fill up that space where the light's hitting with more plants because that's more solar panels that you can put out to grow food. So underneath tomatoes, you can plant anything from lettuce, beets, radishes, carrots. Basil is like the classic thing to do under them. And also like another thing that um, could be great is other than just interplanting, it's um, companion planting. So what I mean is like planting something that it's not only that can uh, fit, fit under like a tall plant, or in between main crops, but also, uh, I don't know, an example like uh, lettuce and spring onions. I noticed that the flavor changes, or uh, like you mentioned, basil and tomato. Basil can, could potentially, you know, uh, along with marigolds, could, uh, you know, help the tomato plants to protect it from um, hornworms or harmful, harmful uh, nematodes, or, um, in, other than improving the flavor, you know, they kind of offer a sort of protection to the plant so you can sort of doing like a um, natural pest control of your garden if you plant uh, your plants strategically. Yeah, I love those tips, man. Those are great. And yeah, you'll just notice too when you do, when you plant a diverse amount of things in your beds or nearby, you'll like check out the bugs that live on those different plants and see what bugs really are attracted to those. You know, there's certain plants out here like um, what's, um, okra and this one plant called mallow. We grew those in our garden beds. The, these Japanese beetles, they're a really bad pest here. They went straight after those plants and they didn't touch anything else. So just becoming more and more aware of those things um, as a gardener, being very observant is gonna really help you um, as you grow in your gardening skills. Yeah, that's like the same that we do here, but we do it with nasturtium, for example. We plant them in corners of the garden or we interplant it. Like I do it sometimes with like tomatoes and peppers or um, with courgettes and, and a few other plants. So I plant it in, in the corners of the raised bed. So it attracts all the black and green flies and it shields all my main crops. And so that plant is gonna be filled up with pests by like our, my actual vegetable. They're gonna be safe. Grow bags, it's another amazing way to grow food. Because I noticed that over there you got some potatoes in grow bags. I do, and I love grow bags. That's something I started doing two years ago. Um, even for my urban plot, I, I experimented like, you know, can I get my cost back if I put these bags out and grow peppers and some other, you know, various vegetables? Can I sell those and then pay off my investment and make money? And I was actually able to do that with grow bags, so it even was profitable 
on a small scale. But uh, for potatoes, they're awesome. They just work so good. Uh, it's so easy. I love that on a grow bag, you can move it somewhere else. Like if it needs more sun or less sun, no matter what you're growing, you can adjust the growing environment. Um, and for potatoes, I think that's just such a good crop. Um, thinking about you know potential future situations is that it has a lot of calories versus uh, some leafy greens like a lettuce. Oh yeah, I, I did the same with my with a few um, crops of uh, first early like not long ago. I harvested like uh, purple purple to, uh, potatoes, and you're absolutely right. Like it's like uh, starchy food, like full of calories, uh, rather than having just uh, leafy greens that you know they're still good to grow. But if you, if you can find a sort of balance in having both, like starchy food and also leafy greens, it's absolutely great to stock up and have more food. So yeah, man, I think, I think we gave a lot of information like, you know, how, how to get ready, how to get prepared, and, and also, you know, how to get started and, and trying to recommend people to start in time, like uh, like don't don't start last minute and 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 wait until something happens. But it's best, you know, to start now and learn things and and try, you know, to to work your way around it. Yeah, this isn't Netflix Netflix time right now. <laughs> exactly. Yes, it's not at all. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. Like for for meeting me today. Like, I think that was really interesting because I, I also had the opportunity to see like how he is over there, how he's having a, like a bigger space uh, because here, obviously, I don't have it. And so, so yeah, I think that, that was great. That was really good, like some nice tips for people. Yeah, man, it's fun to get to hang out with you too. So. Preparing for a food shortage requires detailed planning to make sure that everything is taken into account. However, there is no need to raid shops and hoard too much food as it may deplete the grocery stores and food suppliers, and people might lose their chance to improve their stockpiles. I decided to meet up with Steven, so I could give you a more complete view of how to get prepared in this sort of event, either if you live in a small place like mine, in the middle of the city, or outside, in countryside, with a bigger space. I will leave the link in the description for Steven's profile, and I highly recommend to go and check it out. I hope you liked today's video, and if so, please subscribe to my channel, turn on the notification settings so you can be notified every time I post a new video. And I'll see you next Friday for a new episode. Thank you so much for watching. See ya.